day in a New York courtroom where you made these allegations against your father? Okay, uh, it really started for me many, many years ago, but uh, uh, I had a conversation with my father a couple of years ago. Uh, when I started therapy, I was coming into healing, and I was really starting to understand uh, by watching the relationships my friends had and uh, close relationships um, other people had that uh, something was wrong and amiss in the way I grew up. So I had a conversation with my father, obviously, and um, I understood that he came from, he was a product of his own environment and I was trying to be very understanding about it. And um, I brought it to his attention and it really didn't seem to go anywhere. So I think what happened is, um, I mean, as far as I, I got everything out early, I had gotten everything out uh, with him, uh, through him, I had uh, gotten everything out in therapy. In this particular case, um, I had to stand by the truth, by what had transpired in my childhood, and I could not back down. I had to do it for myself and for people that were in the same position, for the thousands of people out there that are in my same position, that are in my mother's same position, and I thought that it was my duty and my moral obligation to stand up for the truth. Okay, we're going to get to your testimony, what exactly you said in that courtroom. We'll also hear from Frankie, from Francesco, uh, but we have to take a quick commercial break. Live. During our program on Tuesday, I asked Anthony Quinn about charges of physical abuse toward his children. Here's what he had to say. I think uh, I behave like a father. Uh, any father is uh, bound to want to correct his sons sometimes. And uh, I had three sons with Yolanda, and I was a father to them. I mean, I spanked them. I, uh, I hit them occasionally, as fathers do, the sons, not to hurt them, but to make them aware that you are aware of their sins. Uh, I don't think. And uh, I must say that... Uh, Frankie today said, Pop, he used the wrong language. I mean, he didn't mean to say what he did, but even if he did, I mean, uh, I do not. I'm not aware that I ever did anything to my children other than what the average father would do. Danny Quinn, uh, tell us exactly what you said in court on Monday that presumably helped precipitate an end to this divorce proceeding and okay. the settlement between your mother and your father. Okay, I, I will answer that, but I first want to say that I feel, I feel sorry for my father. I, I understand that he may truly not understand. Uh, he comes from a different time and a different environment, and uh, it, this may be foreign language. The words toxic, the words uh, unhealthy behavior may be a, really a foreign language to him, and seeing that right now, um, there's a part of me that feels for him that he may truly be incapable of understanding how his behavior affected me in particular. Um, you know, the, the, his uh, comment on, uh, I spanked uh, my children and I hit them, as a father does. Uh, there, is, there are no comparisons. I am against corporal punishment. And I think when you hit a child, it has grave repercussions on his psyche. And uh, therefore, I don't think it's a healthy thing to do. As far as the court was concerned... Well, well let's just, let's just uh, elaborate mm -hmm. for a second. When you say he, he hit you, did he... I mean, fathers can spank their sons all the time. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily corporal punishment. Tell us what happened my in your My father case. whipped me with a belt that I have at my house right now in uh, Los Angeles. I keep in a closet. And uh, my father uh, uh, punched me. And my father slapped me in my face uh, quite a few times. Um, and it was really the, the, the most frightening aspect uh, for me when I was a child was that it was unexpected and it could come at any moment. So I was constantly in fear of, uh, of him lashing out at me. And, uh, it wasn't an isolated incident? It happened routinely? It happened often. Well, uh, Frankie, do you want to talk about that? <laughs> Those are issues that my brother has with, with my father. I might have issues with my father. Uh, Danny and I have talked about his issues and uh, uh, the way I saw it. I talked, about my I talked to my father the other day. 
the way I saw it, you know, uh, uh, in, in trying to be the elder son, you try and be the mediator, the one that, painfully so, tries to keep family emotions together and family uh, from lashing out uh, verbally. Uh, so uh, I, I tried to make my, my father understand what my brother is trying to say. Not that my brother is incapable of saying what he feels, but the, just uh, uh, the language that my father understands most. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> one would see uh, physical... Uh, I think my brother is, you know, far more uncomfortable with this uh, matter than I am because I've been uh, through uh, quite an extensive uh, therapy and I have dealt with it and uh, it just happened to come up in uh, the court case now and it was a necessary step for me to take, but my cause has really uh, transcended my particular case with my father and I have taken on a uh, much larger scope and that is to help people that are in the same position and that find themselves in an, an what it may appear not to be an abusive situation but it really is. Uh, my, f my brother the other day reminded me of um, <clears throat> a story which I had forgotten about when I was about 13 or 14 my father was teaching me how to drive a car and I was crying because I didn't know how to drive the car and my father uh, pretty much beat me until I learned how to drive that car and I could remember to this day my brother in the back feeling very bad and I could feel his energy as he was um, that was uh, one of the few times that I could actually feel someone else's energy when they felt for me more than I felt for I was crying because I was very frustrated and, and afraid of getting hit but he was actually feeling worse than I was, I guess, in a way. you remember, Frankie, that incident? Um, <laughs> I'd rather not, not even talk about that incident. All right. We're going to uh, take a quick break. We have a lot more to discuss, in, including the actual testimony that Danny Quinn, Quinn delivered on Monday. Stay with us on Larry King Live. Live. Danny Quinn Tell us what you told the judge on Monday in this divorce proceeding before the settlement. Uh, tell us what you told the judge about the relationship that your father had with your mother. Okay, I, I will. I just uh, want to say that, you know, uh, this uh, does not make me particularly <clears throat> happy or proud to be here and to be casting what may seem like aspersions on a great myth and a great legend, but sometimes fantasies must crumble and be replaced uh, by flowering reality and I think this is uh, one of those situations um, now uh, what I said before the judge was I told him the truth I told him the facts and nothing more than that of what transpired in my childhood and that is that my father would lose his temper very often and he would uh, berate my mother um, he would insult her and uh, he would uh, strike her physically uh, often and there were times where he would beat her now having said that uh, he was without sin cast the first stone I am not here to judge my father in any way shape or form I at the trial made sure that I just told the truth of what I saw as a child I have been guilty in my own life of doing the same things I hit my ex-wife I hit my ex-girlfriends and I am single now and there's a reason for that. Uh, I am looking at my own life and trying to break the pattern of behavior. I do not wish to continue with this. I don't think it's a healthy behavior. I don't think insulting someone or berating them in any way, shape or form uh, leads to a healthy relationship. And uh, I have been guilty of that myself and I am trying to correct it. How painful was it for you to testify against your father and, and tell the world in effect about all of this, uh, all of this uh, on Monday in the course of this divorce proceeding. Well, the one painful thing for me was that my father, uh, when I was growing up, I could uh, remember lectures in his dressing room of anywhere from one to two hours when I was a child, when I was ten years old, about responsibility and lying. And that is one thing that is very painful for me that my father has lied. 
about this and is lying about his actions. There's a side of me that wants to be silent and um, let his um, let his soul take his own course. And there's a side of me yet that could not because of the law. I had to speak up. Um, it, it, had this been another circumstance, I would not have said anything, and uh, th th I would have let him deal with his own conscience. But in this in this specific instance, I had to say something. And when I looked at and I somewhere on a show, my father said that I uh, did not look at him in the eyes, and that's another lie. Uh, if anybody knows me, I have no problem looking at people in the eyes, and I made sure that every time the judge or his lawyer or my lawyer asked me a question regarding specifically the violence, I looked in his direction and I wanted to make eye contact because I wanted my father to stand up for himself and I wanted him to admit to what he had done. And to me, you know, if my father said today, you know, son, I've made mistakes, I was brought up that way, I didn't know any better, I'm the first one to say, God bless you. I, that's wonderful, you know, you did the best you could, but I cannot stand and will not stand for someone that lies about something that they did and then will try to make me look as if I'm making something up because I don't make right. stories up. Okay, Danny Quinn, stand by. We're going to take another quick break. When we come back, Francesco, you were going to testify the next day if this divorce proceeding had continued. Maybe you'll get into a little bit what would you would have said if it had been necessary. But we'll think about that and we'll stand by. Stay with us on Larry King Live. Sunday on the next impact. For you to testify. First tell us what happened that led to the settlement, because I understand you were intimately involved. And then tell us what you would have said had you been called before the judge. What I would have said is a moot point. I didn't get to say it, and thank God I wasn't asked any questions, and I didn't have to say anything. You know that Raul Felder, your mother's lawyer, says what you would have said would have been even been more damaging than what Danny said. He would have asked me questions that I would have had to answer, and uh, it, like I said, it's a rhetorical question. It's an if, and nobody knows, and nobody will. What happened was that the judge found the line of questioning uh, embarrassing, to both parties, uh, it hurtful to the family. I was uh, I was in pain during uh, uh, Danny's testimony. Anthony and Yolanda Quinn, before we uh, wrap up that last night, Monday night, in the middle of the night, when you reached a settlement, when your parents reached a, s a settlement, we have some more pictures that you brought along uh, from the family album. Let's take a look at this. What do we see here? Uh, it's my father and I. You know, I never learned that. That was the Zorba dance. We had to do it in public, and I, I never learned it quite well. This is my father at my first uh, uh, tennis lessons. You became he, a good tennis player? He loved, I, I, I'm a horrible tennis player, oh. <laughs> and yet I've had the best tennis teachers in the world. And my father's a big tennis fan and a great tennis player. But Danny, Danny's an amazing tennis player. All right, we'll talk about that at another time. Let, <laughs> let's wrap up that night. What, ex what exactly happened that finally got your, your mother and your father on the same page. They reached the settlement dividing up their assets. Uh, well, it was just uh, me insisting that it just can't go on. You, know, you can't give little things here and there. It's just got to be a big block. Was it, was your father afraid of what you might say on Tuesday that, uh, that forced him into this agreement, you think? You think that was hovering over him? No, I, don't, I don't think so. I, I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, How damaging uh, would it have been, though? If I may interject here, the go ahead. What, what happened really was uh, after my testimony, it was uh, the judge's uh, decision to bring the parties into chambers and to discuss the situation to force a settlement. It was really uh, that's how it came about in the end. Um, she had heard enough, she said, and she didn't want to hear any more of the same, and she wanted to push for a quick settlement then and there. And and, and then there was obviously a lot of pressure. But, Danny, do you think that the prospect of another day of testimony forced your, your dad into making concessions that he might not necessarily have made without that threat hovering over him? Um, I don't think that uh, my father made any concessions that he would not have made. Um, I think in the end, uh, uh, more damage would have been done in any case. I mean, whether it would have been financial damage or 
my brother really did not want to testify, and it was a very painful thing for him, and he, he absolutely did not want to have to go through that, and I understand it completely. My mother did not want to testify, so all in all, I think it worked out best the way it did. I had to do what I had to do, and I would do it again. Um, and I guess the things turned out the way they, they were supposed to turn out. All right, now we have another uh, excerpt from the interview that I did the other night with Anthony Quinn. During that interview, uh, uh, Anthony Quinn seemed to grow more uncomfortable with the accounts of alleged abuse toward his wife. Here's another excerpt from Tuesday night's program. I am not a wife beater. If, I mean, <laughs> that, that's, that's uh, absolutely the wrong... <laughs> picture of, of, of me. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't qualify. I don't qualify as a wife beater. I've had two wives. I don't think I ever struck my first wife. I'm sure I didn't. And uh, if I struck my second wife, it was in self-defense. And uh, I laugh at, the, at these accusations. Absolutely laugh and feel sorry that my son had to wear dark glasses. I, I, I get famous and the people around me wear dark glasses. I don't know what... And, uh, I mean, I'd like to see his eyes. You know, I'd like to have looked into his eyes. Danny, okay, you're, you're, let, me you're, answer, let me yeah. answer that. I would, that. That's very simple. Get me and my father in the same room and let's see who looks at each other in the eyes. I was in the courtroom and I, he made a, a drawing while, during my testimony. My father did not look at me in the eyes once. And it's a very simple test. I am willing tomorrow to do it, and uh, I promise you I will not back down. Um, as far as my father thinking, it's a laughing matter that he hit my mother repeatedly over the course of the years. I think that's sad, and I think, uh, unfortunately, had he been just my father, I would be quiet right now and I would be silent. But my father is a movie star, and my father affects a lot of people. And for him to say that is highly responsible. Um, I believe that he believes he's not a wife abuser, and that is uh, understandable. But for him to deny that he hit my mother on numerous occasions, beat her while I was watching on the couch, helpless because I was a child, and he brings up that I w was 180 pounds, and I'm 185 pounds now, and yes, I do box now, but... I am an advocate of nonviolence, so even had something happened today, I would try to refrain myself from doing anything that I would feel bad about later. I was a child then, and I could not stop my father because I would have been beaten also. Uh, furthermore, the matter that my father likes to bring up, I don't know what dark glasses he's uh, talking about, but I think I did an interview where I was wearing my eyeglasses because I'm uh, nearsighted, and I had a special clip on for them, and I think that's apparently what he wanted to take as me feeling like I'm some sort of movie star because I'm the son of Anthony Quinn and I think that's that is actually uh, just to make it that's another side of him that is more of the same of what I received when I was a child I think that is um, something you're saying something bad about your son and I don't think that can look very good because he is my father after all and why would he put me down like that all right, one other thing your dad did say in, in our interview the other night is that he tried to give all of his children everything possible, all the physical benefits of growing up the, the child of Anthony Quinn. We're going to get into a little bit of that, but we have yet another commercial break. Athens, Greece, so you have a question for one of the Quinn sons? Yes, I do, for both of them. First of all, I'd like to say I have res tremendous respect for both of them. And my question is, do you think that you can hold on to the good memories of their childhood while making a stand as adults for what they feel is absolutely right in this situation? Good question. Frankie. I, I, I try to hold on to the good. Uh, that is the policy of my life. I, uh, I look in the mirror and I look a lot like my father, as you've said, Wolf, and, and uh, I try to hold on to my father's sense of humor. I try to hold on to all the good things uh, obviously facing whatever, like in any family, might have been problems. Uh, every family has their problems. But obviously, you know, my father uh, taught me how to ride bicycles and motorcycles, which are my two favorite things in the world right now. 
And uh, y you hold on to those things, and you hold on to the legacy, uh, mm -hmm. and you try and live with, uh, you know, in, in your personal life, whatever problems there may have been. Danny, uh, it wasn't all just one horror story no. growing up the son of Anthony Quinn. No, no absolutely not. And uh, that is a good question. And absolutely, I mean, part of healing is, uh, is both the good and the bad. There are, this, you know, two sides of the same coin. Um, my father's a, you, you've seen it, the world has seen it, he's a very charming man, he's a very funny man. He can be very caring, he can be generous, he can be all those things. Um, that's what happens, but that's what happens in dysfunctional relationships. I mean, I know it in my own personal life. You don't get, you're not attracted to someone uh, if they're all bad. There's, there, there would be no reason, I mean, uh, very few people would put themselves in that position. It's a far, far greater number of us that are attracted to people that have great qualities to them, are very caring, very loving at times, but then unfortunately there are other times that uh, their darker side comes out, and that is the case with my father. Um, but certainly he, there were good times. He said he gave you swimming pools, tennis courts, <laughs> cars. Uh, the other yes. day he, re he recalled that you needed $5,000, you sent him your Rolex watch, yes. he said don't send me the watch. I just yes. want to be your dad. I don't need any watch. I just will send you the money. Yes, sounds like true. a sounds like a pretty good dad. Yes, in that respect, he was. In that respect, he was. Um, I have nothing to say about that. He was. Uh, there were times we counted on him a great deal. Um, there are times that I thought he could be very fair. I'm disappointed now a little bit. I have to say, um, when he doesn't stand up for what is right and uh, what is truthful, but because uh, those were the teachings that that is why I am standing up. He should be very proud of me right now because that's what I'm standing up for now, what is right and what is truthful. Um, so um, there were good times, and my father could be very generous and giving, of course. Okay, we're going to take another quick break. Some more, some more questions coming up on this whole very, very sad affair. Stay with us, please. I'm learning for me where, where to call him and so forth. And I've, I've just gotten tired of reaching out. I think a relationship, any kind of relationship, is a two-way street. And I, I thought that it was time for my father to start reaching out. Uh, my father talks about his legacy. Yes, he's right about that. He does have a legacy. It's a legacy of material things, pictures and sculptures. I like to think more in terms of spirituality and spirit, and um, I think there's a far greater legacy, and there's a far, far greater uh, uh, risk in uh, in exposing yourself and uh, really bearing your soul, but the reward can be much greater, and uh, that's really something that I wish he would uh, look at a little bit more. Um, if he thinks I hurt myself. I think that the only way to heal is to acknowledge the pain. Uh, and I've felt a lot of pain when I was a child. I went through a lot. And uh, it's ironic that uh, right now uh, I am as strong as I am because of my father. My father was really a powerful, powerful figure when I was growing up. And he almost broke my spirit. But uh, my spirit was not broken. And it's strong. And I'm here. And I stand up for what I believe in. Danny, let me so, ask. Let, let me ask you this: Do you still love your father? As I said in court, they did ask me that question in court, and it's a very complex question. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't know how I feel about my father. It, I have compassion for my father. Um, I understand that uh, sometimes the language I speak is foreign to him. Toxic. Again, I repeat. Uh, you know, things of that nature have no meaning to him. So I try to understand him. Do I love him? I, I think, you know, people want to hear from a son, yes, I love my father, but I don't want to say that just their words. Um, in my heart, um, it's hard. It's very difficult right now for me to love my father because of uh, the, way, the way things have come about and the, the, the way the, the events have turned. Um, I, for him to say, to look at me and say, you know, he was right about that. that children do need their fathers. And I absolutely agree with, with that. And I am certainly willing to look at it and uh, to do some more soul searching on my part. And if my healing isn't done and if 
part of my further healing is to get back in touch with my father and reconcile in more of what I've done in the past, then I will do so. Okay. We're going to take one more break. We have a final segment. I'm going to ask Frankie if he still loves his father as well. Stay with us on Larry King Live. Do you love your father? Yeah, I love my father. I love my father. I don't understand him all the time. I, uh, I love all my family, you know. I love my brothers. I love my mother. I am, uh, I'm a very loving person, you know. I, uh, I'm a very forgiving person. Uh, I have uh, a most wonderful wife. I love my wife uh, more than anything in the world. Um, I, I find there's very little uh, place uh, for uh, for bad feelings in one's life. Life is so so short, you know. If you uh, if if you uh, if you hate people, you just uh, you just you're just killing yourself. You know what I mean? Uh, I just recently went to uh, went to court. Uh, uh, I I was mugged by uh, a gentleman and. Uh, and uh, in uh, the scuffle, I stabbed him. He punched me, cracked my face open, and we went to court uh, because he was accused of armed robbery, uh, assault, and all that. And uh, I, uh, in the courtroom, and then uh, we were alone in the bathroom, uh, me and this uh, young guy, and uh, I feel no hatred uh, towards people. I Dan, think Danny, a, some final thoughts from you? Yeah, I think that's a wonderful thought. I, and I, I am all for that, and I am absolutely with my brother in that. I am uh, an advocate of forgiveness, and uh, myself, I have no hatred whatsoever towards my father. I have no resentment towards my father. What happened in this case was a presentation of the facts of what occurred, and I have no judgment on my father, on how he conducts his life, on uh, the choices he's made. I just had to, uh, right now, take a stand on some things that had transpired in my childhood and uh, they were just factual, nothing more, nothing less. And Danny, if you could say something to your dad right now, what would you say to him? If I could say something to my father, well, I wish my father would call me one day, and uh, he want to have a real, real talk, um, a talk about what's going on in my life, why, uh, what kind of healing I've done in uh, my therapy, what kind of relationships I have with people, uh, if I could have a real conversation with my father and he would be really interested in my life, to know something about me, to know me, I think that would be quite wonderful. That would be quite an accomplishment. Okay. We're all out of time. This has been a fascinating hour, and I'm thankful to both of you, Danny Quinn, Frankie Quinn, for joining us. I'm sure all of us have learned a lot, and uh, maybe some of your pain will, uh, will have rubbed off and other families won't have to go through what yes, I hope both so. of you have gone through. Yeah. Thanks again to both of you for joining us. Thanks, so Yeah, big mean, boy, why not? Well, I just feel that a father has to play the part of a father. I mean, he's, he, I mean, King Lear, he said, I mean, do you love me? You call me. I mean, he should call me. My son should call me. And in the first place, uh, he sent me a watch for, for, because I gave him $5,000. And he said, Pop, I want to give you the watch of security. I have the watch. I don't want the watch. I'm going to send it back to him. Yeah, but that's small stuff. I mean, you're saying he should call. I don't, I don't want to sound like one of those uh, well, soap right. operas, but okay. You're waiting for him to call, and he's waiting for you to call. Okay. Now then, do you have any money left? Some people say you're worth a fortune. Some say no, you're going to be worth about, I'm worth about, I have the money you here. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then there's this whole business of an 82-year-old man, with a, and I know that my pals want to join me on this, Marrying a woman of 35, starting a family again. Some people think that that's really sort of unappealing. To whom is it unappealing? To me? Go ahead. Tell me no, 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 no. It's not unappealing the to me. The age difference. I, no, no. I mean, the age difference means nothing. I mean, I have a wonderful daughter. You just saw her. I have a wonderful son, uh, an unusual son. This son. This, this son, this, Ryan. That little boy. And uh, Kathy is a very unusual woman. And... I've known her for 12 years. I mean, it isn't as if I, I, I just, it just happened. And I'm, I'm very, very happy to be with her. I mean, if, if she can take it, then I, I, I'm very happy. <laughs> she's smiling and she seems very lovely. 
Uh, I know that my, um, my friends on the panel have a lot that they want to ask you. So okay. Meredith, the star, and Debbie are going to come in, and then you'll have a lot Does of women. Is Garofalo coming in? <laughs> Janine, no, well, we could have her in too, but I think, <laughs> listen, right now I think no, four, no, she's, she's I think four she's, of us she's are She's from Rhode Island, and I think she'd understand my, my position. You do, huh? Yes. Well, try, try it with the rest of my friends. Okay. We'll be right okay. back with Anthony Quinn and the rest of us.